Hello everybody, welcome back to Five Sisters Zoo. This might look a little bit odd, but I'm gonna tell you why I'm sitting in what looks like a pile of sticks in just a few minutes time. We're back up here at our bear enclosure where we finished off on Tuesday. I had the opportunity on Tuesday to tell you guys a little bit about Esso, the brown bear that's living here at Five Sisters Zoo right now, and a little bit about the bear rescue work that we've been involved with since 2012. Now, I promised that today we would discuss a little bit more about how bears have adapted to survive in the woodlands across Europe. Remember, it's European brown bears that we've got here, so it's the European brown bears that we'll be talking about today. Now, I'm sitting in what looks like a pile of sticks, a pile of twigs right now. This is my kind of recreation of a bear's daybed. Now, bears don't tend to build these in the winter, Instead, these normally get created in woodlands in, in the summer months when bears are out looking for food and they want to take a little nap, they want to have a lie down. They'll kind of create these little day nests on the ground out of sticks, twigs, rocks. They'll maybe dig a little hollow in the ground as well where they can lie comfortably. And normally it's in a nice sheltered area where they're not going to be easily spotted by any other large animals that might be out there in the forest. They do something altogether quite different in the winter months though. Some of you guys at home might already know this, but in order to survive the cold European winters, bears go to sleep. They go through something called torpor, which is a little bit different to true hibernation that things like hedgehogs might go through. Bears, their, their heart rate will slow down. Their breathing will slow down. They tend to go into a den or into a kind of cave area where they'll sleep out most of the winter and they'll sleep right through it and then they'll get back up in spring and the reason that they do that is because it's it's very very cold there's not much food available and it's much safer for them to to slow down to go to sleep than it is to stay outside use up lots of energy and find it quite difficult to find food now their behavior has to reflect this change so their behavior throughout the year has to reflect the fact that they're, they're going to get quite sleepy normally in the winter months. So throughout the rest of the year, bears tend to gradually put on quite a bit of weight. And in the autumn months, they absolutely gorge themselves. So they eat lots and lots of, kind of calorific berries and fruits that they can find in order to put on enough weight, a nice big layer of fat, so that they can go to sleep in the winter months. And that's how they survive those cold, harsh winter months in some of those northern European forests where we find them, those forest habitats. Now, Esso, unfortunately, we can't actually show you her right now because we're really proud to say that she is going through torpor at the moment. So she is fast asleep. She has a lovely big enclosure here at Five Sisters Zoo and uh, she has an uh, ample opportunity to, to go to sleep in the winter, go through this torpor, and our keepers here make sure that she is fed uh, the correct diet to allow her to do that. So her food will gradually be increased throughout the year. And in a, a couple of weeks time, when we're talking a bit about diets and food chains, I'll tell you a little bit more about what Esso likes to eat. But for now, what we're gonna do guys, is we're gonna move from focusing our attention on cold animals, or animals, I, sh I should say, animals that live in cold environments, to animals that live in hot, dry places instead. So guys, to talk about animals that come from a much hotter, drier environment, we've come here to our fennec fox enclosure. Now, fennec foxes come from Northern Africa. They come from the Sahara Desert, where it is very hot during the day and it is incredibly dry as well. Now, obviously, we're filming this here in Scotland, where it is much, much cooler during the day. And right now it's winter, so there is a kind of dusting of snow on the ground. Imagine that does not exist. That is not there. We are in the baking hot Sahara Desert right now, and we're looking for our fennec foxes. Now, this fox species is one of the smallest fox species on Earth. In fact, their bodies are really quite tiny, but their ears are huge. Now... Remember on Tuesday, we were speaking about our snow leopards and we were speaking about how they've adapted to survive in a very kind of cold mountainous area. We said they had small ears that helped reduce heat loss. These guys, the fennec foxes, have huge ears and that's to promote heat loss. So they radiate heat. They lose lots of heat through their ears, which helps to keep their body nice and cool. Now, they also have quite thick 
kind of long hair on their bodies, um, which helps to protect them from the sun. Um, they've got quite long hair on their feet as well. It's for a completely different reason to the to the snow leopards that we've already discussed. Again, that long hair on their feet helps to protect their feet from the kind of hot sand when they're moving around. Now, right now, I'm going to walk across this way here just now, and you'll see that the enclosure looks quite empty. And that is for a very significant reason. It's the middle of the day. It's very, very hot in the middle of the day in the Sahara Desert. So fennec foxes tend to be fast asleep. These guys are nocturnal. So they tend to come out and look for food at night time instead of during the day. And that way they can hunt, they can look for food when the temperature is much, much cooler and it's much more comfortable for them to do so and less dangerous as well. So unfortunately, we're not gonna see any fennec foxes in the middle of the day here. So I'm gonna leave you guys with a short clip caught on a camera trap here at Five Sisters Zoo of what our fennec foxes get up to at night time. And I'm gonna see you guys in a few minutes time in our education center, where we're gonna meet a slightly different kind of animal that comes from warmer, drier climates. So we are joined here in our education centre by a rather important little individual. Uh, please excuse the kind of squawking in the background. We do have a couple of African grey parrots in here temporarily just now as well. Uh, that have been a little bit vocal today. But this guy in front of you, this is Sultan. And Sultan is a little leopard gecko. Now, leopard geckos, like this little guy here, come from over in places like India and Pakistan. They live in very dry environments, just like the fennec foxes do as well. And, and these guys, the environments that they come from, the habitats that they, that they occupy, they tend to be very warm throughout most of the year, but in the winter months, it can often get quite cold. Now, you can see, just by looking at his body, that he is quite well adapted for living in that dry, arid environment He's very well camouflaged. He lives in amongst rocks and dust normally, so he's very, very good at blending in, just like the snow leopards that we had a little look at back on Tuesday. Now, something really weird about a leopard gecko is their tail. These guys have incredible tails. You'll see his tail's quite chunky. It's filled with fat and nutrients. And in the winter months, when the temperature drops slightly, these guys, go into a, a, a deep sleep, a bit like the bears that we were speaking about earlier on. Yeah, so these guys will go into a deep sleep and they'll use all that fat and all those nutrients, they'll break it down, and that gives them lots of energy to survive the colder winter months when normally these guys are asleep underground somewhere or in amongst some rocks. Now, they can do something quite unique with their tail. If Sultan here was to be chased by a larger animal, say a big bird of prey, he can voluntarily drop his tail off. That tail continues to kind of wriggle about on the ground and that big predator that's been pursuing him will probably be quite happy to sit and munch on it because remember it's full of nutrients, it's full of fat, it's gonna be quite tasty. This guy's gonna be able to run away and camouflage somewhere where he's nice and safe, hiding amongst some rocks somewhere. Now, he can then grow his tail back again. This tail here has never been dropped off before. See, it's really, really nice um, and, and kind of fully formed. It's quite straight there just now as well. These guys, when, when they're young, their tail is made of bone. But if they drop it off for some reason and try growing it back again, which they can do, it comes back made of cartilage instead. So it's based on cartilage, this bendy stuff inside your nose is cartilage. And that's what the tail is made of instead when they grow that back. Now. That is an amazing adaptation, dropping their tail off like that is an incredible adaptation that allows them to avoid being eaten. But it's not always that beneficial. Imagine if this guy was to drop his tail off 
and then try to go into a deep sleep in a really cold winter time, he wouldn't have all of those nutrients, all of that fat to keep him going. So they tend to, to do that only if they really, really have to. So as a last resort, but these guys are so, so cool. They're really amazing little animals. And you can see that these guys can actually blink. Most geckos can't actually blink, but these guys can. And it's probably got something to do with the fact that they're living in very warm, sort of dusty, rocky environments um, where, you know, there's potentially a lot of wind blowing sand and dust around. So these guys can close their eyes um, to protect them. But they are absolutely amazing. Now, what we're going to do next, guys, is we're going to move from looking at animals that live in warm, dry environments to looking at some species that live near the water. So, now we're going to shift our attention from some of the driest, hottest habitats on Earth to some of the, the places where there's the most water. We're going to be having a little look at an animal that comes from some of the, the world's mangrove forests which are very unique habitats. We are going to be looking at our fishing cats. The wetlands and mangrove forests where we find fishing cats living over in India and Sri Lanka and surrounding countries are very, very important habitats and they're really, really quite different to any of the habitats that we have discussed so far. They're very important for people as well as for the, the huge number of different plants and animals that call them home. Mangrove forests in particular, they grow along the coastline and they actually help protect the land from the power of the sea, if you like. So any kind of incoming storms hit this kind of protective barrier um, before smashing into the land where people obviously live. Mangroves also help prevent soil erosion. So they basically help the la stop the land from crumbling away into the sea, which is absolutely vital for many, many human settlements over there in the sort of tropical parts of the world where we find these mangrove forests. That's one thing I should say, mangroves tend to grow in the tropics, so in the much warmer, more humid parts of the earth, but always along the coastline. Eh? And when you see a picture of a mangrove forest, it looks a little bit like lots of little channels, lots of little canals going through vast forested areas. And, and those forests, the trees, almost look like they have stilts. They're absolutely amazing. The trees are really well adapted to living in those sort of very wet habitats, just like the fishing cats that we have in the enclosure here behind me. So you've already seen one of our fishing cats in a, in a short video. They are really, really cool. They're, they're a kind of medium sized cat there. They belong to the small cat family and they are just superb at living and hunting in these wetlands and in these mangrove forests over there in Asia. They have sort of webbed feet, webbed toes that allow them to swim really, really easily. These guys are perfect for them just diving down and grabbing small fish, small crustaceans, things like crabs. They'll also eat, um, you know, other small kind of shelled animals as well, um, but certainly lots of aquatic um, sort of food. That's what these guys like to eat. And they're going to be found living in these channels in between the trees and these mangrove forests and out there in those wetlands as well. They are the perfect predator. Now they have a very kind of dark pattern on their bodies, which again, like the snow leopards, that allows them to blend in with their surrounding, to stay nice and camouflaged. It allows them to hide from any larger predators that might be out there. And it also helps them to use the element of surprise when looking for food as well. But they are super cool. Now what we're going to do, guys, to finish off this part of our habitats and adaptations lessons, we are going to be heading into our lost kingdom to look at one more aquatic species. So to finish off our lesson today, we've come over here to the lost kingdom to see our two Rotti Island snake net turtles. 
These guys are absolutely fascinating. They're here in the tank beside me. You can see one of them sticking their head just above the water there, the other one down at the, at the bottom of the tank. Now these guys, as the name suggests, they come from Roti Island, which is over in Indonesia. That is the only place on earth where you can find these guys living in their native habitats. They tend to live in fresh water. So they're gonna live in small pools, small ponds, lakes, small streams on that island. That is the only place on earth where you are going to find them. And unfortunately, this species is now considered critically endangered. Now these guys are perfectly adapted for living in those pools. They tend to eat small invertebrates, so things that don't have a backbone. They're going to eat snails, small um, bugs that might live on top of the water, flies, things like that that might land on those pools. And these guys have got that long neck so they can bend it back and they can strike out to grab their prey. Now, as I've mentioned, they're critically endangered right now. Unfortunately, there are many different aquatic species, both plants and animals, that have suffered over the past few decades. Global climate change and increasing levels of pollution in the sea and in fresh water, that is causing a real, real problem. And unfortunately, last year, there was another problem added to the mix. Many of you guys at home might know a little bit about what I am talking about. We've all started wearing these face masks, and I'm now gonna encourage you guys at home as much as possible try to use a reusable face mask yeah the other kind of face mask these ones here the ones that you can just throw away unfortunately they cause real problems for much of the world's wildlife things get tangled in these and more and more of these are ending up in the oceans and in rivers and places like that and it's really impacting much of the world's aquatic uh, wildlife and lots of wildlife on land as well. Now, if you are using these disposable masks, one little trick, when you throw them away, guys, please make sure that you remove these straps so you pull them off just like that before you throw them away. And that helps prevent anything from getting tangled up in them. Brilliant. So, that's about us. That's about us finished today, talking about habitats and adaptations. I hope you guys have really enjoyed the last two lessons. Now we've come across to the Lost Kingdom today, not just to see our snake neck turtles, they are amazing, but also because this is where we're going to be spending a lot of time next week when we talk about one very, very important kind of habitat. Next week is going to be all about the rainforest. We're going to be talking about the different animals and plants that live in the world's rainforests. We're going to be talking about why they're so important how they're structured, the different layers of the rainforests, and why they're now threatened as well, and what we can do to try and help protect them. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this week. I hope you've enjoyed these two lessons as much as I've enjoyed making them. Thank you so much for tuning in again today, and I'll see you all next week. Thank you.